Let's talk about cataract surgery complications. We won't be able to go over every complication, but we'll try to go through the more common ones, how we manage them, and answer any questions that you guys have about those thoughts. So posterior capsular tear. We'll probably beat you over the head quite a bit during this uh, lecture with this particular complication. Uh, it's obviously a violation of the posterior capsule. Uh, Posterior capsule tear with vitreous loss, uh, vitreous loss excuse me, will increase the risk of several different uh, potential complications, including endophthalmitis, cystoid macular edema, retinal detachment, uh, eye wall malposition. Of course, it increases the surgical time and cost. It uh, can compromise the desired eye wall placement, uh, which is in the bag. Uh, there is the potential need for further surgery, depending upon uh, when that uh, occurs and what occurs with it. Uh, and obviously, there can be, because of the additional surgical manipulations, delay in visual rehabilitation and recovery. So the best management is prevention. Let's just try and keep it from happening, right? So uh, several things that we can do during surgery to help us to stabilize the anterior chamber and to help protect the posterior capsule. So first, in terms of stabilizing the chamber, well-constructed wound and capsule rexus, uh, proper fluidic settings, in other words, the inflow equals to the outflow. Uh, with the uh, FAGO machine, uh, and that of course helps to avoid post-occlusion surge. Instruments, uh, we can use a modified FACO tip that is rounded uh, as opposed to a sharp edge. We can use uh, soft silicone uh, or a polymer uh, IA tip. Uh, we of course saw those who were in M&M uh, last week, we saw what happens uh, with the, uh, the tips if they're not soft and gentle. Uh, surgical technique, of course, we, we can protect the capsule with a second instrument uh, with final fragment emulsification. Can I ask a question about that? Like, sometimes I worry, like, the second instrument, like the chopper, it seems kind of sharp. Right, well, yes, you want to use a second instrument that uh, is blunt-ended or gentle. Uh, so if you use a sharp chopper to do a vertical chop, for example, once you've completed your chop maneuvers, you can remove that second instrument and go to a Drysdale or some other type of second instrument that is... Uh, more capsule friendly, so to speak. You'll see that with, with surgeons that like to use the vertical chop technique if they have a sharp chopper. Uh, so you can make that change uh, the way you hold the instrument. So if it's uh, you know, like, like a chopper that's like this, you know, holding it and angling it so the surface area that you're using is, this is obviously not a sharp edge, and it increases the surface area that's provided to help hold the, the capsule back. Uh, that, that can be useful. I will tell you it's not foolproof. That capsule can still come around and, and get the FACO, uh, FACO tip uh, because it, and the surface area is not great on those, those second instruments, but it may be helpful. Um, hydrodissection using a dispersive viscoelastic can also be helpful uh, in select cases. Obviously there would be an increased cost with that. Uh, but placement of the viscoelastic to tamponade the capsule, uh, particularly in cases where there's not much cortical material uh, in place, very dense cataracts, white cataracts, you might find that useful in terms of helping to keep the capsule back in place. So those are a bunch of different things that we can do to help prevent this particular complication. The other things that we can talk about, uh, just recognizing when we are at higher risk for these types of uh, issues. So a weakened posterior capsule, such as in a posterior polar cataract, uh, as we talked about, again, a dense cataract that has little or no cortex to mold the capsule. In those cases, we might use uh, a dispersive viscoelastic to help hold that capsule or mold it. A soft nucleus, so a young patient with a posterior subcapsular cataract, sort of an example of that. Uh, not, not much energy is required to penetrate through all of the material. You might use a, a, a variation on a technique called a brown maneuver where you might pop the lens out of the capsular bag, at least partially, to remove the lens more safely, uh, either that or a flip and chip maneuver. Uh, zonular weakness, uh, so in cases where, of course, we're always looking for these uh, issues at uh, the VA pseudoexfoliation, prior trauma, prior interrogative surgery, uh, such as a vitrectomy, or less common causes, congenital aniridia, other uh, congenital conditions that might be associated with zonular weakness. So those are different situations that we're looking at saying, okay, this is a more, more risky situation for different complications. Let's plan and prepare in advance to know how we're gonna handle things to try and prevent it uh, and be watching for the, these types of issues. So if we have a posterior capsular tear or management goals, uh, every maneuver is made to try and avoid extending the tear. Uh, we wanna maintain chamber stability, so pressure gradients will drive the vitreous out 
uh, of the eye or drive the vitreous to go to areas we don't want it to, and so we want to try and maintain the pressure gradient between the anterior and posterior chamber. Uh, we don't want to irrigate towards the tear of the vitreous because we can hydrate the vitreous or disrupt the vitreous that way. We want to use uh, OBD or viscoelastic copiously, but not excessively. We need to place what we need to maintain the space and maintain the pressure gradient, but if we fill it too aggressively, it can cause the tear to extend, it can cause disruption of the vitreous, uh, and cause it to come forward. And so we want to be um, careful, or we want to understand uh, the balance there in terms of what we need it for and not being too aggressive with it. So the steps when we recognize a tear, uh, we leave the main instrument in the wound. The viscoelastic will be injected through the paracentesis to tamponade the vitreous, sort of uh, maintain the space of the anterior chamber. We might buoy any residual nuclear material, try and hold it in place so that it doesn't fall back. Uh, we want to reduce our surgical settings, so some might describe these as flow max settings or low flow settings, or you might just use your epinuclear settings because they are typically uh, slower settings. Uh, if nu nuclear material remains, we can phaco that or perform extra capsular extraction techniques as long as the vitreous has not come forward. We want to partition the space or compartmentalize the, the lens material and vitreous. Uh, if we're going to phaco it, uh, we're going to move the pieces manually away from the tear. We're going to use, again, OVD, viscoelastic to support those, keep the vitreous face back, uh, prevent things from coming forward, and you're going to phaco above the iris plane. Uh, you can use some dispersive viscoelastic to protect the corneal endothelium. Uh, you can also use a modified sheets glide. I can sort of as a pseudo capsule. You can slide that in, or you can even place uh, the lens, a uh, sulcus placed intraocular lens or an optic capture with a sulcus position of the haptics uh, can be placed to serve as a pseudo capsule. So lots of different ways to reintroduce the partitioning of the anterior posterior chamber to try and help prevent vitreous from coming forward. Uh, when we go to remove cortex in the setting of a tear, we're going to, again, low flow settings, we're going to turn everything down. Uh, we'll start with removing cortex furthest from the tear and we're going to strip uh, or try and remove the cortex towards the tear to minimize the amount of stress that occurs on the capsule uh, and particularly on the capsule in terms of where the tear is located. And depending on the location of the tear, uh, we may need to attempt dry or manual cortical remo removal techniques. Uh, in the end, if we leave a tiny bit of cortex in that area, it may not be the end of the world, uh, just making decisions about how to do that safely. A uh, bimanual IA can allow irrigation to be separated from aspiration, so you can direct the irrigation away from the tear. Uh, that'll help to uh, maintain chamber space as well. So uh, this is often what we will go to in the setting of different capsular tears, keeping the, the main wound closed and allowing us to separate that irrigation, keep it away from, I mean. So what happens like if we leave like a lot of Well, you're going to get a big Sommerings ring because uh, that cortical material will proliferate the, the lens epithelial cells. That's, that's what will happen eventually. Uh, in so her case, probably won't need surgery. No, in most cases, no, you shouldn't. And, uh, in her case, she may have maybe wise to do a YAG early on within a few months so that you can get through that material. If it's really thick material, you may have to do surgery to remove that very thick PCO, so to speak, so. All right, let's talk about uh, if vitreous has come forward or encountered what we do. Uh, in most cases, we need to deal with this before we move to any other step. Uh, so we can use triamcinolone as a stain uh, or other uh, stain uh, to help ascertain whether it has come forward and whether it's been successfully removed. Uh, bimanual vitrectomy with irrigation directed away from the vitreous tear. So similar the vitreous or the posterior capsular tear, so similar to bimanual irrigation aspiration. We want to separate these two so that we're not irrigating into the vitreous, hydrating the vitreous, and causing the vitreous to come forward. Uh, so there is uh, co coaxial vitrectomy equipment available uh, with some machines. Again, I don't encourage you to use it because you're basically going to be doing a core vitrectomy. You're going to be sitting there for a while because you're hydrating the vitreous and encouraging the vitreous to come forward with that instrumentation. Uh, you can consider a pars plana placement of the vitrector. 
uh, and that would, in theory, help to draw the vitreous back, might help to minimize the amount of vitrectomy time that you have to use, but it will require uh, knowledge and understanding of placing a trocar in a different gauge vitrectomy instrument versus doing a conjunctival pyridomy, uh, creating a small sclerotomy and going through that and then having to suture close uh, that sclerotomy and the pyridomy. Uh, but that's certainly a way to do things and some advocate doing that. Uh, you can also consider a dry vitrectomy with the use of OBD, so you're just removing some vitreous, placing viscoelastic to sort of hold it back and then going back and forth that way or by manual technique with irrigation again. Sorry, another yeah, question. Yeah, go ahead. So how hard is it to get transitolone? Because it seems like, you know, I haven't seen people, you know, get it when I feel like it might be helpful. So, um, well, you know, here know. we're able to get it reasonably easily uh, because we can have our pharmacy prep it, whether it's removing the, the preservative and some of the ingredients to Kenalog or using a preservative free form uh, that is already designed to be injected into the uh, into the poster chamber into the vitreous like triacids. exactly like triacids. So, how about like an open close situation like or primary children's or the it may be more challenging to get it there. Uh, you might have to see if they have triacids, asking them to to have that in place. If they don't have it, you're just going to have to use other means to identify vitreous, uh, either through uh, you know. My call to bring the pupil down, looking for peaking, uh, testing with wax cells at the wound to see if there's anything coming forward. Uh, it's not always going to be a perfect situation. Fortunately, here you have access to it. That's why we talk to you about it and teach you how to use that. And then when you get out to wherever it is that you're practicing, you can certainly inquire and try and encourage them to have triessence available because, again, it's already prepped and, and available to place into the eye safely. Uh, but you, you may not have access to it. I didn't have access to it in private practice. So. It seems like it's a lot better because you can actually see the vitreous. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a very nice nice way to, to just sort of, at the, particularly at the end of a case, just inject a little bit of it, confirm there's no vitreous coming forward and give you that peace of mind. But um, not always, unfortunately not always ideal where, where you're at. Okay, let's talk about management of lens material with vitreous prolapse, so we can use the what's called the visco trap technique. We're trapping the residual nuclear material near the cornea with a dispersive uh, viscoelastic. We'll fill the AC with OVD. Uh, we can perform the vitrectomy to remove any vitreous that has come forward into the anterior chamber, uh, replace the OVD that's removed. Once we've confirmed that our vitreous is cleared and properly compartmentalized, we can focus on the lens material. Uh, again, we, as we've talked about, we can create a pseudo-posterior capsule either with a trim sheet glide uh, poster chamber intraocular lens that's placed properly in, in the sulcus or optic capture, reverse optic capture, whatever you want to do, but trying to create that, that uh, pseudo posterior capsule can also be very helpful in terms of preventing vitreous from coming forward again and giving you the clearance to go ahead and place a phago handpiece in there and take that uh, residual material out of the eye. All right, let's talk about vitreous loss. We've talked a lot about posterior capsular tear defects. We can also have a zonular dialysis uh, that can uh, create a situation where vitreous can come forward. Uh, we've talked about vitreous stain, off-label use uh, with uh, Kenalog and preparing it to remove the preservative, or of course we can use triacins preservative free. Uh, vitrectomy settings, so we want to start in the cut IA mode. So you'll have the option, at least on the Alcon machine, of being cut IA or IA cut. Basically what that means is in the cut IA mode, you're going to irrigate first, then it's going to go to the vitrectomy cutter mode. Aspiration would be in the third setting. So you're not going to aspirate anything in this cut IA mode. It's going to allow you to cut the vitreous, allow it to, to retract back posteriorly, uh, and minimize the aspiration forces that might draw, draw some of it forward. Uh, once you've removed the vitreous, uh, you can use the vitrectomy handpiece to remove residual cortical material, for example. You can go to an IA cut mode. Uh, and aspirate, again, in position two, uh, aspirate that without being in the cut mode and then move to the cut mode to remove it. Uh, in vitrectomy settings, when we're trying to remove vitreous, we want a high cut rate and a low aspiration rate. Uh, so you'll notice if you look at the settings of your attendings in terms of vitrectomy settings, usually the aspiration rate is quite low. If you're moving to try and remove cortex, you may want to, or remove OVD, you may want to tell uh, the surgical scrub tech to increase your aspiration rate to help you I remove that more efficiently. Uh, again, I encourage you to separate the irrigation to a bimanual as opposed to coaxial. 
uh, technique, and we can always, of course, consider a parse plane approach for vitrector uh, use in select cases, uh, or if you feel more comfortable with that. All right, so if vitrectomy was required, a thorough dilated exam in the early post-op period, any, actually, any time you break or violate poster capsule, we should do a dilated exam uh, in the early post-operative period to evaluate for any retinal pathology. Uh, because of the traction we're placing on the vitreous, we could create a small retinal tear or uh, we could predispose them to higher risk of retinal detachment. We want to evaluate for those, catch them early, obviously, uh, to provide appropriate treatment and maximize their vision quality. Uh, if vitreous presents post-operatively, so you're looking at them day one and you're seeing vitreous, if it's entrapped in the wound, there's risk of what we call wicking, uh, which uh, can allow uh, for bacteria a path to get into the eye, so increased risk of infection. Uh, you can stain it with fluorescein at the slit lamp. You'll get bright green temporary stain if the vitreous has actually been externalized out of the wound. If that's the case, you take them back to the OR to remove it. Uh, if vitreous has just incarcerated the wound but it has not been externalized, you can use the AG laser uh, to uh, lyse that vitreous that's come forward. Uh, and if you can lyse it, it will retract back typically into the poster chamber eventually. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit challenging getting the AG to focus specifically on that, but if you can get it lice, and it's not too difficult as long as you can visualize it, uh, uh, then, then it will retract back. Sometimes there will be some uh, pigment from the iris on the vitreous helping you to identify it and visualize it. Uh, regardless of presentation, wherever we're finding it, we need to find a way to deal with it because it's uh, poten potentially creating vitreoretinal traction and that, of course, increases the risk of retinal tear and retinal detachment associated with that, and it can also increase the risk of systemic macular edema with that tractional force. All right, so a poster capsular tear, one of the things we can do to try and uh, prevent it from pr um, propagating, yeah, depending upon how big the tear is initially, uh, is to create a primary, uh, or not a primary, a posterior continuous capsular rexus. If it's a small linear or incomplete circular tear, uh, we can use instrumentation to just create a continuous posterior capsular rexus. Uh, we're going to use OVD to create space and maintain that pressure gradient between the posterior and anterior chambers. Uh, usually it's going to be micro-instrumentation, so our MST sets are going to hold the instruments that we want to use for that. Uh, and then we can consider reverse optic capture with the intraocular lens in the bag and the optic captured through that capsular rexus, uh, or you can just place it in the capsular bag. Uh, I probably wouldn't reverse optic capture it, I would just place it in the capsular bag. Or you can do a sulcus placed three piece lens, haptics in the sulcus, and then capture the optic in the anterior capsule rexus. So, lots of different ways to place a lens safely in the bag, but if you can create a circular posterior capsule, capsule rexus, now you've stabilized the capsule, it's not going to extend further, and it may make your life a little bit easier in specific situations, just depending upon the extent of the tear. Uh, most of the time, in my experience, the tear is probably too great to create this, uh, but if it happens to be a small tear that's created or a normal circular tear that's created, you could just finish that uh, and uh, stabilize that. So let's talk a little bit about uh, lens placement in the, in the setting of the posterior capsular tear. So if, um, if we have an anterior capsular rent, I don't know if anybody's seen that in the operating room yet, so that can happen with a second instrument inadvertently striking the anterior capsular tear. Uh, the FACO could ac accidentally strike it and create a tear. Uh, if you've done a femtosecond capsular rexus, if there's been a small tag, sometimes it can create or increase the risk of having a small anterior capsular rent. Uh, you can place a one-piece acrylic in the capsular bag. You're just going to orient the haptics 90 degrees away from that tear to help prevent it from propagating further. Uh, you're going to go to low flow settings to remove the OVD. You're going to be a little bit gentler to try and help prevent that from propagating around the uh, capsular equator. A small posterior capsular tear can facilitate in the bag placement of the eye. Well, we just have to be careful not to extend the tear. Uh, and of course, we talked about this, converting the tear to the posterior capsular rexus uh, prior to placing the eye. Well, we never want to place a one, a one piece acrylic eye well in the sulcus. Shorter length, thicker haptics, sharp unfinished edges to the haptics is going to create UGG syndrome, and you're going to have to remove that lens. I've never seen a lens in the sulcus, a one piece, that didn't have to be removed. So. Uh, if anybody ever suggests doing that, you just tell them, no, we're not doing that. So if you have an attending. I don't think we have any attendings now that would suggest doing that, but if that looks like it's happened, 
get that haptic in, into the either into the capsular bag and reverse optic capture it. And what that means is haptics behind the, the uh, capsular axis and the optic anterior to it, or remove that lens and place a lens that can be safely placed in the sulcus. All right, let's talk about sulcus fixated uh, lens. So a three-piece lens with C-loop haptics in the sulcus, and of course we can capture the optic in the rexus. In other words, uh, placing the optic poster to the rexus. Uh, if we're placing it in the sulcus, we want to reduce the power by approximately a half diopter. Uh, if it's a higher powered lens, you may even reduce it by a full diopter. If it's a low powered lens, you may not need to reduce it at all. Uh, low power lens, you know, something under the, about nine diopters probably does not require change in the power. If it's about nine to 17 or 18, probably just a half diopter. If you're over about 18, you may look at a full diopter. If you're at a really high power, say 27, 28 and beyond, you may even reduce it by a diopter and a half. So there, there's sort of a table that's available on that. But rule of thumb is for the average Iowa power, it's about a half diopter reduction. Uh, <clears throat> a large anterior chamber, or if they've got a large sulcus, you may not have a lens big enough uh, to fit in the sulcus to, that will help to avoid sunset or sunrise with the lens decenters because of the size of the anatomy of the eye. In that case, um, trying, trying to capture the optic will make a big difference in that situation. Or a larger diameter IOL, which uh, was a star uh, silicone three-piece IOL, was a little bit larger diameter IOL. It's no longer being manufactured, so we don't have that available. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of figuring out if it isn't stable in the sulcus, suturing it to the iris, finding some way to fixate it, uh, you may, may need to do that. Uh, and Bobby Osher, who's a surgeon based out of Cincinnati, uh, he trained uh, Bob Sioni. Um, he's got this, uh, what he calls the bounce test. You intentionally decenter the sulcus IOL and watch for it to bounce back into a more centered position. If this doesn't occur, rotate the, hap the IOL haptics to a new position and try it again. Make sure that you've got a stable uh, sulcus position for that lens. And if it's not stable, consider suturing it to the iris to fixate it. Most of the time it will bounce back or be, be fairly stable. And the average eye, the anatomy is such that that lens should be fairly stable. But if you've got a very large eye, uh, this is particularly useful in terms of testing it, seeing if you can find a position where that lens is going to remain uh, stable. All right, so if we have inadequate capsular support, what are our options in terms of lens position? Uh, an anterior chamber intraocular lens is always an option. Contraindications to that, uncontrolled glaucoma, extensive anterior synechiae, iris tissue loss, uh, different things that would create situations where we might worsen the glaucoma or worsen uh, the synechial uh, extension, or if we don't have the support of the iris, uh, we can't place the lens safely. Now, when we're placing an anterior chamber lens, we've got to attempt to size it or fit it properly. Uh, this isn't foolproof. Sometimes this doesn't work, and you might have to go back in and remove the anterior chamber lens and replace it. Uh, but we're going to measure the horizontal corneal diameter. We're going to add a millimeter to this size, and that's, uh, that's the sizing that we're going to use for the anterior chamber uh, lens. Each haptic needs to be flexed, lifted, and allowed to reseat into the angle structures to minimize any iris entrapment. Uh, we're trying to minimize the risk of that. Uh, alternative options, maybe some point here in the U.S. we'll have an iris claw IOL that is foldable. Uh, right now the, uh, the lens that we have that's FDA approved that's used in phacic uh, refractive procedures, uh, it's a uh, PMMA lens, so you have to make a big wound to get that into the eye. So I don't necessarily use that for this, but certainly that's available in other areas of the world. A poster chamber lens, we've talked about this, iris sutured, uh, one or both haptics can be sutured to support depending upon the amount of capsule support that exists. A scleral sutured lens can be used as well. So those are the different options that we have if the capsule support is inadequate <clears throat> in terms of lens placement. Of course, can leave them aphakic uh, if they don't have much vision potential as well. I mean, uh, so I've heard this multiple times about the size of the ACI well, but then I've seen You still want to size it. If it's too big, it's going to vault for, too far forward and create increased endothelial cell loss over time. So I would suggest sizing them. In most cases, that BNL lens is going to be reasonable. Uh, it's a larger lens. Uh, again, 
you don't want to put something that's too big into the eye. Uh, so sizing can be helpful. But we, I think here at the Moran, we only have two sizes of anterior chamber lens. We have an Alcon lens, which is a little bit smaller. And then we have the B&L lens, which is a little bit bigger in terms of the size that we stock. Uh, but they have multiple different sizes that they, that they manufacture. And so if you're planning on doing a secondary lens, planning on placing an anterior chamber lens, you can do some of these measurements, get an estimate of the size that you want, and order some additional sizes just in case you need to make a change uh, to that. But you know, it's obviously measuring the corneal diameter is a poor estimate. I mean, it's a poor man's estimate of the, uh, the size of the uh, angle or the sulcus, uh, different ways to estimate that or uh, you know, it correlates to it to some degree, but not, not perfectly. Um, so again, the BNL lens, it's a big lens. Uh, so if you've got a small eye, I wouldn't put it in a small eye. It's going to vault too far forward. So still good to check that. But, you know, if you're thinking anterior chamber lens, while you're in surgery, you only have a couple of options. Otherwise, try and plan in advance so that you can order different sizes so that if you find that, hey, this is vaulting too far forward, it's too big, you can take it out easily and just have them change it to another lens. Does that make sense? Yeah. The white to white, just like, can we use that? Yeah, you can use the white to white. Um, you may want to measure it yourself as well with calipers at the slit lamp just to confirm that that size is appropriate. But yeah, if you're planning on a secondary lens, you're going to use those white to white measurements uh, to give yourself an estimate of what you're looking at. Look at multiple values. Okay. Yeah. okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. Let's see. Like I said, we're going to beat you over the head with posterior capsular tear information. Uh, so final steps after we've managed posterior capsular tear, we've done everything else we've talked about thus far. We can use acetylcholine or myocol to constrict the pupil. This, of course, helps us to identify if there's any residual vitreous that we've missed. If we see pe peaking of the pupil, that would suggest there's vitreous coming around, there's tension on that area of the iris. It will help to tamponade additional vitreous, uh, preventive additional vitreous prolapse uh, and allow you to more safely remove the OVD with bimanual IA or bimanual vitrectomy instrumentation. Um, you can remove it manually, just injecting or irrigating uh, that OVD out. Um, we want to try and avoid chamber collapse as much as possible. Sometimes it's a little bit challenging to completely avoid that, but uh, obviously, if that chamber collapses, it changes the pressure gradient, and in theory, you could have late vitreous prolapse, loss of optic capture of the eye well, a number of different things that, that can impact that. So ideally, trying to find a way uh, to stabilize that chamber using your assistant to help you in that regard. Uh, suturing the primary wound prior to these steps can assist in preventing chamber collapse. So either suturing it uh, with 10 nylon or 10 vicryl or you could use a wound sealant like Brasure. Uh, to stabilize that main wound and just use uh, your paracentesis uh, to finish up the bimanual uh, OVD removal. That'll help to stabilize the chamber as well. Uh, if you've dropped the nucleus, avoid heroic efforts to recover it. Retina people are very good at taking care of this for you. Uh, and if you go after it aggressively, a lot of vitro-retinal traction, increased risk of retinal detachment. The retina people won't be as happy with you if you do that as they would be if you just go to them with, with a drop nucleus. Um, you can consider a posterior assisted levitation, levitation technique if it's just sitting in the anterior hyaloid face, not too far posterior, uh, and that involves uh, using OVD to essentially elevate that lens back to you. Uh, there's a surgeon by the name of, I can't remember her name, she's out of Iowa. I think she's retired now, but she's a, an asso a, a um, adjunct professor here at the Moran. Uh, she's created spears um, to stab the lens and bring it back. I don't think I have any. We could look it up and see if we could find, Lisa Arbister is her name, see if we could find some video on that, show that to you just for fun. Um, placement of the IOL still recommended uh, because modern vitrectomy equipment is very good at handling even the densest of nuclei uh, in the, the uh, poster chamber. Optic capture can be very helpful to the surgeon for sub their subsequent PPV, stabilizing that lens so that they don't have to worry about that. Uh, being an issue. All right, let's move to a different type of complication. So iris prolapse or injury. This is more likely with a posterior wound entry, short wound. Um, so we need to try and have an uphill orientation, if you will, uh, to our wounds to reduce the risk of this. It's greater risk with conditions that result in a floppy iris. So uh, Flomax, exfoliation, other diseases that impact uh, stromal 
uh, integrity or muscle integrity. Prevention strategies, pupil expansion devices such as a Malugan ring or iris hooks, uh, cohesive OVD like Helon 5 or Discovisc, uh, intracameral epinephrine, sugar cane, uh, these things might help to stiffen the iris or phenylephrine uh, has been shown at least in one study that was published uh, from a group I believe in England that seemed to help uh, stiffen the iris in IFAS cases. Preoperative non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops uh, can also help uh, prevent that by helping to uh, in expand or maintain dilation of the pupil. If the iris has prolapsed, the management is we want to look for posterior pressure. Do we have OVD behind the iris? Where is the lens position? Is it in vaulting forward? Uh, we want to try and release that pressure uh, first before we try and reposit the iris. Because if there's a significant pressure gradient there, we try and push the iris back in, we're just going to damage the iris, and the iris is just going to come right back out. So uh, we can release that pressure by repositing the lens. So in the case of hydrodissection, if the lens is vaulted forward, pushing that lens back into position, releasing that fluid that's behind it, um, releasing OVD from the paracentesis wound to reduce that pressure gradient uh, can also be very helpful. And then we can gently sweep the iris back into the AC. We've created some space, reduce that pressure gradient, and we can use a small amount of OVD to hold it in position. Uh, some advocate considering creating a PI in the area of prolapse to equil equilibrate the pressure gradients. Uh, that's certainly something you can do. Uh, one thing that may be helpful, particularly if you have a short wound before it's happened multiple times, uh, creating a paracentesis beneath your wound through the sclera uh, and then placing an iris hook to hold the iris back can also be helpful. Uh, at the end of the case, myocol uh, or a myotic agent can be used to help constrict the pupil. Uh, and reduce the risk of having this happen right at the end of the surgery. Uh, in general, the principle is the greater the manipulation of the iris, the greater the meiosis, pigment loss, distortion, flaccid nature, and possible bleeding for the minor iris root or root tear can occur. So uh, if you're having it manipulated multiple times, we really ought to be thinking about doing something more definitive to hold it back, whether it's a PI, whether it's an iris hook, and trying to do that before it gets to a point where it's so uh, damaged uh, that you end up having to abandon that wound and going to a different wound or you end up creating a significant problem that has to be dealt with with a secondary surgery uh, or uh, you know, some sort of iris replacement device. We want to try and avoid that situation. Uh, incision complications. So wound leak, of course, increases the risk of endophthalmitis. If the, this, we can suture the wound, if the IOP is low or the cha chamber is shallow, go back to the OR and do that. If we find a, a small wound, lake with the wound leak, but the uh, AC is stable, there's no shallowing, and we have a stable IOP, we can use an aqueous suppressant with a bandage contact lens and follow it closely for resolution or whether we need to go back and suture that. If there's any distortion or it's difficult to close with suture, uh, you know, take a step back and look at it. Make sure you don't have a wound burn that you've just not recognized. Uh, prevention, of course, is good wound architecture, good surgical technique with instruments in the wound, trying not to stretch the wound too much with your instruments, learning how to pivot uh, within the wound as opposed to putting a lot of pressure on one side or the other of the wound. Uh, a wound burn or wound contracture, of course, is generated through excess heat released from the phaco handpiece, usually uh, in an occlusion setting, so if you hear occlusion bells, particularly if you're not occluding lens material, uh, you have to take a step back and figure out why is it doing that before you allow for too much phaco energy to cause harm uh, and create a wound burn. Uh, it's usually most commonly seen with inappropriate sizing of a wound and tip sleeve, so this can pinch off the irrigation, which is, of course, very important to cooling the tip. Excessive phaco with full tip occlusion, so those warning bells, you keep hearing those and you're using phaco and it's not clearing that. Increase the phaco energy to clear the lens material if it's just dense lens material or take a step back and figure out what's going on. Is there OVD occluding my tip? Do I just need to take the handpiece out, clear that out? Uh, you know, be sure to think about why is that occlusion warning still going off. Uh, full occlusion will eliminate aspiration, that's why we're concerned about that, of course, as a key component to irrigation flow. Uh, and so if, again, if those warning bells are going off, we need to figure out why they're going off. Uh, increased phaco power, of course, to clear the tips we talked about with dense lens, or we can aspirate the OVD overlying, overlying the lens before beginning to reduce the risk of OVD plugging the phaco handpiece and creating 
a situation where you get a wound burn. Certain uh, viscoelastics uh, will propagate uh, heat better than others. Some have more exothermic properties, so it's important. Again, just clear a little bit of that off the, the top of the lens before you start the case uh, to minimize that risk. Uh, wound burn management, it's just difficult suture closure of the wound. Um, it sucks. I've never had, I've never done it, but I've seen videos of it. It looks very unpleasant. So try to avoid a wound burn would be my recommendation. Uh, other incision complications, a decimase membrane tear. This will most commonly occur with insertion of surgical instrumentation. So you just have to be careful as you insert it and remove it to minimize that risk. If it does present during surgery, you can use viscoelastic to tamponade it. Uh, you might be able to use a single suture to hold it in place. Uh, at the conclusion of the case, sometimes you can use gas, suture, a local, just small amount of viscoelastic. In many cases, they're very small. You might see them at the very end of the surgery. If they're very small, usually they'll just hold themselves in place with uh, hydration of the wound and uh, I, excuse me, VSS placed in the AC to hold it in position. Uh, but if it is more extensive, we have to use something to try and hold it into place. Uh, let's see, those are a couple of quick things on uh, incision construction. Uh, so you have different concepts, clear cornea, near clear, scleral tunnel options. Uh, it's most important to ensure ease of access into the eye with uh, surgery. Placement is, uh, can be decided on, do they have a prominent orbital rim? Astigmatism management can be used, pre-existing anatomy like a tube or a trap, a corneal scar. Uh, the more anterior the entry of the incision, the greater the astigmatic effect, the greater the endothelial cell loss. Uh, with a clear corneal incision, of course, we want to start it as posterior as possible, right at the limbus if we can. Clear incisions require shorter tunnels compared to scleral tunnel inc incisions, as you all know. Um, a scleral tunnel, you can use a set blade to create the initial groove. Too short of a tunnel, you can prematurely enter into the AC, uh, or you can actually enter into the suprachoroidal space, so be aware of that. That can result in intraocular bleeding, hypotony. Uh, it can be a little challenging because there's a little bit of an uphill entry uh, component to it, which results in more globe movement and corneal striae with instrument movement. Clear cornea, if it's too short, it's tougher to seal, uh, greater risk of a leak post-op. If it's too long, uh, you get corneal striae, instrument movement is restricted more with that, uh, and it can be difficult to access the subincisional nucleus and cortex uh, to remove those. Some of you who have been operating are starting to understand these concepts a little more. All right. High IOP, uh, we've got a differential that we've got to consider in terms of what could be causing that. Retained OVD, retained nuclear material and fragment, endophthalmitis, TAS, aqueous misdirection, or malignant glaucoma. So we've got this uh, differential that we've got to consider, try and figure out what the underlying cause is that will guide our management. Um, assuming you no know, exam fe features of less common causes such as aqueous misdirection or TAS or endophthalmitis, uh, most commonly it's going to be retained viscoelastic material. Uh, in that case, we could consider burping the wound. Um, we want to use pre and post antisepsis, uh, some sort of antibiotic or povidone iodine solution that's been prepared for use on the surface of the eye. Uh, with wound burping, understand that it only reduces the IOP temporarily. It only takes a couple of hours for the body to replace the aqueous. And so you need to make sure that you've gotten a good response and then you're adding some sort of aqueous suppressant therapy uh, to help maintain that reduction in IOP. So burp the wound, place the drop that you're going to use or the medication, give them a dose of it, check the pressure in a couple of hours to make sure the pressure is uh, being maintained at a level that you're comfortable with. Um, of course, we can use topical and systemic aqueous suppression. Uh, Alphagan and some of the other topical agents aren't going to lower pressure a ton. They might lower it by a few points. Keep that in mind. And so if you're looking for a big drop in pressure, Systemic di diamox is going to be your friend in terms of these uh, post-operative IOP management cases for a few days just to help keep that in check. If corneal edema is present, we want to be more aggressive with our IOP reduction effort. It, uh, number one, it'll help to facilitate clearance of the corneal edema. Number two, the corneal edema is suggestive of potentially higher pressures that have been present. We want to get that pressure lower and more aggressively lower it because it suggests that there are greater risk for having another pressure spike. And of course, always confirm the efficacy of your work 
recheck that IOP either that day or bring it back the next day to make sure that it is effective. Now, you don't want to bring them back in a week with a blown pupil because of high pressure over that entire week. All right, so retain nuclear fragment. If this happens to be the cause of the elevated IOP postoperatively, uh, nuclear material will incite a significant inflammatory reaction in IOP spikes. So we've got to manage it uh, until we can get it out surgically, aqueous suppressants and frequent steroids. Uh, you may have to do gonioscopy to identify an unexplained IOP spike with increased inflammation in the anterior chamber, so look for a small nuclear fragment in the angle. If the material is cortical or epi epinuclear, the response is usually much milder, and you may be able to manage it medically, and the body may be able to clear that mild, small amount of material. If it's a more significant amount of material, you may have to go in still surgically to remove it. Wound leak, let's see, I think we talked about this already, and we're all done with that. So does anybody have any questions about anything we've talked about thus far? Okay. So let's see if we can find, I wanted to find that Lisa Arbister Spears. I found some videos, but it didn't show the Spears. You didn't find the Spears? She had like a Miyaki video of her. I know there are some decent videos of management of a uh, poster capsular tear. Here, let me close the PowerPoint. On YouTube, Jason Jones. Let's see what we can find. Let's see. So Jason Jones is a former resident of the Moran. He's now a um, high volume surgeon in Iowa. So we can watch his management here of a poster capsular tear. See so he's creating his wound there, very deliberate in terms of the angle that he's using. Rex is completed, almost. So you can see he's got a sharp chopper there. He's doing a sort of a modified vertical chop technique there, burying the tip, going peripheral and driving it posteriorly and towards the tip, ideally coming across so that the tip remains occluded. And then he can keep it buried and, and make another maneuver there. You see now we've got a break there posteriorly. You saw it come forward. You see he's kept this instrument in. You see he's got a cannula and he's placing some viscoelastic to tamponade the vitreous from coming through that posterior capsular break. And you see he still has some lens material, so he's going to try and just compartmentalize that within the anterior chamber. Now that he's stabilized the pressure gradient, he can come out with the main incision and go in with some additional viscoelastic to help compartmentalize the lens material. You see he's just placing some viscoelastic posterior to that lens material, trying to, again, compartmentalize it. Now he's going to go in and remove it. I think he's got, it looks like an OVD cannula, so he may be injecting a little bit of viscoelastic behind as he removes it. And you can see these multiple uh, edits into the video that's likely because he's going in with viscoelastic injecting and then going back into the Fago handpiece and just going back and forth in that regard. You can see here he's just manually removing that small final piece here. You've got bimanual vitrectomy instrumentation there. See how his irrigation, he can control that, keep the irrigation pointed anterior, and he's removing now cortex using the vitrector. So again, you can go from a cut IA to IA cut setting there, 
So you can aspirate that cortex and remove it safely. And again, a little more viscoelastic. Tamponade the vitreous, keep the chamber form properly. The bimanual, of course, you can switch sides with the vitrectomy handpiece, allows him to get the rest of the cortical material out here. A little more viscoelastic. You can see he's expanding the wound so that he can place a lens here. This is a single piece acrylic. He may be placing it in the capsule bag or doing reverse optic capture. We'll kind of watch and see what he's doing here. What's the purpose of the reverse optic capture? It allows them to use the single piece acrylic lens that uh, they had planned on using so they don't have to open, open a different lens. That would be the main purpose behind it. Uh, reverse optic capture is sometimes used for negative dysphotopsia, so you'll go in and actually prolapse the optic anterior to the rexus, and that reverse technique, uh, Sam Maskett advocates that for uh, patients who have persistent uh, negative dysphotopsia, so that dark arc that they, that they will sometimes complain about initially. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If the poster capsule is not stable, you put the whole lens in the bag, it may not be stable. Uh, stable um, situations. So that lens may decenter, may fall back, may cause that tear to extend as you put the lens into the bag. Uh, so yeah, you, it's not uh, it's not a situation that you want to be doing unless the tear has been stabilized. It's circular. It's not extending. Then you could consider placing a lens in the bag. In this case, he was doing reverse optic capture. He's placing the haptics posterior to the rexus. The optic he's actually prolapsing and keeping it anterior to the rexus. It'll create a kind of a square-shaped rexus when you look at it. How did he get the posterior posterior? It was the phaco handpiece. Uh, it must have popped up. It was hard to see. Yeah. Video quality is not terrific, but. At some point here, as the lens material clears, the poster capsule pops up. I think it's right about, let's see, right about here, right there. See that? Yeah. So as it comes through, uh, you can, you'll hear Dr. Mamlis talk about avoiding lollipopping the lens, so getting into the center of it and breaking through the back surface of the lens material and then allowing that poster capsule to pop up. In this case, I thought he was doing a good job, I and mean, it looked like he had an edge position on the lens material, which normally will result in the lens sort of carouseling, but in this case it went all the way across and then the lens popped up, uh, or the capsule popped up to the phago handpiece. This will happen to every one of you if you do cataract surgery. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So uh, just understand how to manage it, uh, and of course if you're here with us, we'll help you through that process. Uh, but uh, it's just important to understand the basic principles maintaining those pressure gradients to minimize the risk of vitreous coming forward, uh, managing, depending on the situation, when it happens, managing the lens material and getting it out safely, and making good decisions about what lens and where to position it, and, and making sure that the vitreous hasn't come forward at the end of the case. Just a few things you can do uh, to look at that. Does anybody have any questions? So if you're going to reverse optic capture, you don't need to change the lens power even though the optic so that's a good question. Uh, some will advocate changing it like you would with a sulcus lens by about a half diopter. Uh, in that case, just get another lens. I, I like the three-piece lens. Yeah. So the uh, the uh, optic capture looks better and it's a little easier because it's something I'm used to. But this is something that some of them will advocate. They'll just, because that's the lens they're using, they'll just reverse optic capture it. The patient's slightly more myopic, you know, maybe by third to a half diopter difference from what the uh, lens calcs are calling for. So I mean, it's a way to do, deal with things. Or if you get in a situation like I presented, let's see, we can look at these videos again. Um, So you get in this situation like I was in with the IA handpiece. Well, where did it go? That's really weird. With the IA handpiece, we've already got a lens in the bag. We're just removing OVD, and that capsule came up and 
still don't realize that it came up and it's broken until I'm watching the lens here, and, or I've got, oh yeah, there's vitreous. You can see that, I don't know if you can see that little stringy material coming to the tip, so. In this case, I could have lifted that lens out like I do and left the lens in the eye. We could have reverse optic captured uh, that lens and not had to remove it and replace it with a three-piece lens. Um, we decided not to do that just for refractive purposes. Um, but that would have been an alternative option in this situation where you, you get a break in the bag with the lens already in the eye, reverse optic capture. with If you have an intact anterior capsular rex, this is a very reasonable way to manage that particular case. So, all right. Any other questions? Okay, thanks guys.